I'd like to begin by providing you with a sense of tonight's program. After President Broadhead's introduction, we will allow Chairman Riley to provide his thoughts on the Oil Spill Commission's report and its impact. Chairman Riley and I will then have a brief conversation to my left about its findings, its impacts, the response uh, from Washington and other venues. After which, we will turn to you, the audience, for your questions. But first, let me please introduce Duke President Richard Broadhead. At the Institute, we were thrilled to co-host this event because it's a good example of the service we can provide to entities like the Commission due to President Broadhead's leadership. When the Commission re requested help from the Institute evaluating the challenges of Gulf rest restoration, Duke was able to help. We brought together a team of professional staff and faculty to focus on questions and quickly and nimbly prepared a report on restoration. Much of the inertia and delay found in universities was avoided due to the institutional designs put in place by President Broadhead, Provost Lang, and their colleagues. This is the sort of service to society that the university, by the university that is the vision of President Broadhead. It is his leadership and initiative that has created structures at Duke that allow us to put it it at the service of society. And so, it is with great pleasure that I am able to introduce to this university's able leader, President Dick Broadhead. Why, thank you, Tim. I would encourage all employees to talk with such respect on all occasions. I suppose everyone in this room can remember a day in April, I think it was the 20th of April in the springtime of last year, when we got news uh, that oil had begun to gush out of the BP Deepwater Horizon uh, oil rig in the Gulf. And after that oil began to gush, it continued to gush and continued to gush. And I was, uh, a person in my office was so kind as to share a website with me called If It Were Your Home, uh, this is the size of the spill in the, in the Gulf, but would you please click it to center it as if this were on Durham? Okay, now, now look, at, look at this. You see it goes way past uh, Goldsboro and Kinston and then way past Winston and in fact extending all the way into Tennessee here. Uh, so we're talking about a mammoth spill. My information is uh, that the Exxon Valdez spill covered something like 3,000 square miles, and this about 70,000 square miles. So we're talking about something, I think that this can now go away. Uh, uh, we're talking about something about 20 degrees. I mean, you know, uh, I can center it on your house if you want <coughs> to me to make it really scary. Uh, so we're talking about uh, the birth of something that from the first instance had the air of an environmental crisis and something that reminded us of the sort of potential crisis that is latent in the nature of everyday life in modern culture. The lights in this room, the power by which this sound is transmitted, the power by which your cars got you here, everything we do all day long takes for granted the availability of energy that we almost never see the origins of, but if we were to trace it to its origins, it relies on processes of extraction that when put under enough pressure can themselves become extremely risky and, and show the danger we can do uh, to the planet we require uh, for, uh, for our sustenance. There's a tradition in this country that when there is a crisis of a certain magnitude, what you need is to have a commission. And the point of the commission is, first of all, to establish in some incontrovertible way the facts in a situation where the facts have, uh, have often been debated or uncertain. And then second, to try to establish in some incontrovertible way the lessons that could be learned so that this kind of circumstance doesn't take place again. So we had a 9-11 commission, we had a Challenger commission. I remember uh, the assassination of President Kennedy was followed by a commission, uh, and so too, uh, uh, the oil spill in the Gulf uh, was followed by a commission. But it's the nature of these commissions that they're born in crisis. They mean, they mean to speak to the crisis and to pull something valuable out of the crisis. But in order to work, they need a certain kind of leadership. Somebody has to accept the leadership of such a commission whose name right away brings the kind of integrity, the guarantee of impartial objective results. Uh, in fact, the, the confidence, the trust that itself is one of the principal victims of such a crisis. 
Uh, I think that President Obama uh, had that, that must have been the easy part of his task in dealing with this, uh, because when it came time to set up a commission on the oil spill, he asked two people who had just that trait. Uh, 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 one, uh, Senator Graham of Florida, a state with a massive and very long coastline, as you know, and to our guest today, Bill Riley. If I were to tell you the life of Bill Riley, uh, it seems to me I could tell it to you in such a way that you would see this man was born to head the commission he was named to this past year. Uh, there's, as far as I can tell, there's scarcely a feature of his life that was not part of an intricate providential preparation of you uh, for the task that fell to you. Uh, this guy went to college in the 60s. He went to law school. He went in the military. And when he finished that part of the training was just at the moment of the ripening of the environmental movement in America that had taken wings in the early 60s, but had reached the moment around 1970 when the environmental movement began to be institutionalized in powerful legislation, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, uh, in government agencies like the EPA, which was created in 1970 and celebrates its 40th anniversary at this time. So a young man of talent uh, uh, comes on the scene just at the moment when there is this new scene, this world of taking responsibility for the environment in a, pub uh, in, in a public way. Uh, so, uh, some of uh, Bill's early jobs were in the government and oversight of environment. Uh, then he went into the NGO sector where he at a very early age become, became the head of the World Wildlife Fund. And from there, he was chosen to be the head of the Environmental Protection Agency by the first President Bush in the year uh, 1989. I'm told you were the first person to come straight out of an environmental uh, 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 action group into the EPA position. Uh, he had been uh, the head of the EPA for, fi for five weeks when the Exxon Valdez uh, uh, spill uh, first took place. Uh, so that's to say, that's, he, he didn't just hold the office of EPA, he actually really had to do the work of responding from the first to the environmental crises and dangers that are implicit in our, uh, uh, in our everyday life. While, uh, while you were the head of the EPA, uh, you uh, earned a record that I think it may be many years before anybody is able to uh, dethrone you from it, overseeing the cleanup of the uh, Exxon Valdez, uh, overseeing the reauthorization of the Clean Air Act with the first cap and trade uh, uh, regulation in it that uh, helped to con uh, control sulfur dioxide uh, and acid rain, uh, overseeing the implementation of the first American trade agreement to have environmental uh, dimensions built into it, as was true of NAFTA in your time, uh, overseeing the representation of the United States at the uh, Earth Summit in Rio, uh, where you worked hard, though at the end of the day not totally successfully, to make Amer America a part of the first global pact to address questions like um, uh, uh, climate change and biodiversity. Since your service in the government, you've held a million other positions uh, in all kinds of sectors. Uh, now you are the leader of Aqua International, an investment group that looks for um, a, a, a clean water supply investments and renewable energy investments. Uh, and in your, your many uh, uh, new dimension, every year new dimensions of experience, uh, you show the same traits of expertise, uh, of understanding that environmental issues can't be solved by moral polemics, but actually need um, uh, expert knowledge, need an understanding of the role of government, of the role of NGOs, of the role of industry, the role of the corporate sec sector, and the ability to bring those interests together, because uh, that's the place at which solutions are found. Uh, it was a great uh, piece of good fortune for Duke, and Tim, you helped me remember it. Uh, the Nicholas Institute of Environmental Policy Solutions was proclaimed as an idea in, if I remember right, January of 2004. I came as president in the summer of that year. Uh, I had the fun of, of getting to appoint uh, and recruit the director of the institute, and I had the special fun of getting to uh, 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 help recruit uh, the person who came to be the head of the board of advisors and has given such important strategic advice uh, to the Nicholas Institute through uh, the years of its life. Uh, Tim, I think you set the right note. This is a university where we hope that talented people will come in early life and become interested in the problems of the world that actually need talented people to care about them and, and, and find careers using their intelligence in service of finding solutions to such problems. If anybody said, what's a, what's a career that exemplifies those kinds of traits? I would say to you, how about the career of Bill Riley? Thank you so much for being here today.
Well, I recall once being present when Henry Kissinger got an introduction that he was not entirely satisfied with, and he said, of all of the introductions I have ever received, that was the most recent. <laughs> I, I think of all introductions that I have ever received, that was the most satisfying. And I am profoundly grateful for it, and particularly coming from Dick Broadhead, for whom I have uh, boundless respect and admiration. And I think this university is so fortunate to have him. And I think about the priority of putting the university at the service of society and what an important commitment that is with the resources that, that this university, a great university, research university has. I have actually seen it very much up close under the leadership of Tim Profeta and Bill Shamidis who have worked to make this institution I think probably the most specifically um, relevant and entrepreneurial, and that is to say immediately available and effective policy institutes around. The contribution that uh, the institute made to our commission was considerable. Restoration, I have to confess, when I first heard about this spill, what immediately occurred to me was that for so many years, we have known what an important resource exists in the Gulf of Mexico, particularly along the Louisiana coast, where some 30% or so of the continental America's wetlands reside. We're losing them at the rate of a football field an hour. But um, they are the home to much of the fish life in the sea. They're really vital to major industry, the fisheries industry, which is also partly a tourism industry, one of the three pillars along with energy that exist in the Gulf and particularly in Louisiana. And I thought, finally, looking ahead to the inevitable fines and penalties, which will be in the double digit billions, we may have real money to put behind the restoration of those resources. That has never before been true, even though we have projects that have been authorized. And the key person on our staff who oversaw this vital part of our recommendations for the future was Eric Roston, who was lent to us by the Nicholas Institute. And he wrote the restoration materials. And I'm sure this will get a good deal of attention on Wednesday when I testify along with Senator Graham before the uh, Senate Energy Committee in the morning and the House Natural Resources Committee in the afternoon. And we defend our proposal to allocate 80% of all of the fines that are finally assessed under the Clean Water Act for this bill to the Gulf and specifically to restoration itself. We have, uh, I have already uh, briefed a number of people about the restoration proposal and, and I think the most memorable one was with Governor Riley of Alabama who uh, was very upset about these decisions because um, he likes the idea that all the money should go to restoration, but his idea of restoration is um, uh, to re reinforce the tourism industry, which has been badly hit in Alabama, by um, building a new casino. And uh, our commission did not come out there. Uh, well, to go back to, to first causes, I was invited to take the position by uh, the president's energy and environment advisor, Carol Browner, who called to uh, asked me to do this. I was in San Francisco at the time, and I began to demur by saying I have business relationships. Specifically, I'm on the board of an oil company that would probably make this inappropriate, ConocoPhillips, from which I took leave finally to do this. And she said, um, we know more after a week of vetting you than your family about you. Uh, and the president considers it an advantage that you know the industry and have those relationships. And so I did, in fact, um, take the position and move to Washington to do it. Our first meeting with the president was, um, Senator Graham and I, was, um, was very interesting for his perspective on the issues. I remember he said um, a couple of things that uh, I thought were highly presidential. He said the Three Mile Island Commission set back nuclear energy in this country for the rest of the century. I don't want that to happen here. He uh, also said, uh, I don't want you to write me a new energy policy. 
think you could see stars in our eyes. For, we, we have some ideas along those lines. And um, finally, he said, and please do not interfere with the ongoing civil and criminal investigations conducted by the Justice Department. And that has probably caused some confusion when our first report came out uh, a week or so before January 11th, when the full report came out, the stock price of BP jumped up two percentage points. And one explanation for that is we did not use the word negligence or gross negligence, which are terms that are specific to a certain level of fines, $1,100 and $4,100 per barrel. Um, but that was very deliberate. We avoided in any way uh, assessing guilt and simply went to causes. And the executive order that established us asked us to determine the cause, the specific proximate cause of this bill, determine the root cause, and then recommend the future of offshore oil and gas development. Well, we took testimony for the first time in the Gulf itself, and we heard from the people most impacted by this disaster. I had considerable experience with the Exxon Valdez oversight and um, saw nothing there to compare with the distress and the extensive impact over five states that uh, was evident with respect to the Macondo spill, the April 20 spill. And that most poignant of all, I think, was Vietnamese fishermen who uh, had nothing that they could do with, in the way of fishing. The fishing beds were closed, particularly the close-in oyster and crabbing beds where they were, what they fished for could not escape the way uh, the larger fin fish could, the spill. And um, they were uh, reduced to uh, standing in line in the morning for $100 food coupons from Catholic Charities. And uh, they don't speak English. And they, um, there are some 40,000 of them. This is quite a substantial population. The tourist industry, as Governor Barber of uh, Mississippi told me, he said, there isn't any oil within 60 miles of us. This was on, uh, Labor, on uh, Memorial Day weekend. But we have 30% uh, occupancy on what is ordinarily the most important tourism weekend of the year here. Uh, the reputation that uh, fisheries develops, I confirmed myself when I ordered in in New York at the oyster bar some oysters and asked whether they were possibly from the Gulf and was told, no, we would not serve seafood from the Gulf. So seafood processing came to a halt. And the number of lives in these industries that were affected were very considerable and uh, will take a long time, particularly the brand destruction, the reputation problem, which caused tourists not to even to go to Key West, we learned. Europeans began to cancel it, and of course the, the, the oil never got close to it. So this, this put us in, in a frame of mind to be deeply sympathetic to the people most heavily impacted, and also to look very closely at the degree to which that coast had been affected, channeled, dredged, and degraded over many, many years for many reasons, flood control, but also for canalization for oil and gas pipelines. So the energy industry was very present and a very important contributor to the economy of the Gulf, but also was implicated in transformation since the 40s of substantial and important resources, ecological resources. We uh, had hearings also in Washington, uh, and we, uh, had some concerns about the fact that our commission did not have subpoena power. And so many people have raised the question, well, how could you ever get to the bottom of a disaster like this without subpoena power, without the power to compel someone to answer your question, or at least take the Fifth Amendment if they won't? And uh, to, to deal with this, and I, I look back on how well we did without subpoena power, we, um, we hired a lawyer, and I was told one day, and I was back in California for that moment, that uh, Fred Bartlett, a very famous trial lawyer, an expert at presenting complex technologies to juries, wanted to go to work for us. Now, he had been the uh, investigator for the Piper Alpha, a bigger blowout in the North Sea in 1989. And he wrote, essentially, the Cullen Report, which is considered the Bible among such reports. 
And when I heard that, I said, well, I, he, sounds, he sounds very impressive. I'd like to interview him. And then uh, Richard Lazarus, the executive director of our, of our commission, said uh, he also was the lawyer for Bush in Bush v. Gore and twice uh, defeated David Boies in jury trials in Florida. And I thought to myself, that means that Jim Baker, uh, former Secretary of State Baker, would have selected him for, in his case, the trial of the century. Uh, I don't think I need to interview him. Sign him up. <laughs> so when I met with him, I said, uh, what are we going to do without subpoena power? And this is a man who's about 6'2", six, 6'3", six, uh, an ex-army uh, ranger, called John Wayne in pinstripes um, by, the, by the trade, has a reputation for intimidating other lawyers and charming juries. And he said, I don't need subpoena power. He said, I just go down to Houston. I'll bring one lawyer with me. I'll call up one of the companies, and I'll tell them, tomorrow, 2 o'clock, it's my hotel room. Bring your witness. Be there. They'll say, oh, we couldn't possibly be there. Tomorrow, that's just uh, too short notice. And I say, look, you got 500,000 lawyers getting, I don't know, $500,000 an hour. Be there. <laughs> he said, they're always there. They know if I'm not. If they're not, I'll kill them. <laughs> so that was my, uh, he, he also said uh, something I thought, I saw a little bit of the skill with the jury. He said, you're from Decatur, Illinois. I'm from Harvey, Illinois. Ain't nobody important ever came from Decatur or Harvey. You and I have something in common. We got here on our own. Okay, so he went to work. He had an enormous uh, respect from the industry itself because he had represented many of the same companies. And uh, though we thought that might be a vulnerability, and he thought, no one ever really raised it because they watched him conduct himself in a way that was not adversary. And I must say, an important way in which we proceeded was to show respect for those who spoke before us and for the companies themselves. And I reminded myself more than once, um, this was not 9-11, though our commission was often compared to it in some ways. Nobody intentionally killed anyone. This was not evil rampant. These were the blunders of well-meaning men and women that had fatal consequences. And there's a big difference. So he didn't set out to convict or to indict. He set out to truth tell. And not that that was easy or done without a lot of conflict and even shouting in our conference room, as Halliburton accused us of being too friendly to Transocean, who thought we were really letting BP off and, and so forth. But we, we did get to the bottom of it. And uh, we know with respect to everything but one important question, and that is the blowout preventer and why it didn't work. The blowout preventer wasn't even pulled up out of the sea until late August, and it's still in a warehouse uh, being forensically examined in Louisiana, or Houston, I guess. Uh, with respect to every other part of this decision, we are confident that we did, in fact, get to the bottom of it. We um, had a critical question as we began the inquiry. And the question was, is this the misbehavior of one company which historically has had serious problems managing process safety, BP? It um, was responsible for a refinery which blew up, killing 15 people in, 19, uh, in the year 2000, I guess, uh, in Texas City, Texas. And then one year later, had the experience of um, uh, spilling 5,000 barrels of oil over three days, which it took to find out that this was even happening for BP on the snows of Alaska. And therefore, there was reason to believe that um, the company uh, could have been implicated in something of this sort. And I could just say from my own experience with the oil and gas industry, BP was considered to have problems. Tony Hayward, the CEO who succeeded Lord Brown, on whose watch those two earlier disasters occurred, spoke early on of his intention to correct that and to improve the agency, the, the, the company's performance. So I, I went in with a, with a prejudice. I thought it probably was a BP um, mistake or screw up. Uh, what we concluded, however, is that three companies were implicated. And there appears on page 125 of our report, which I was going to hold up for you, 
um, a um, chart. This is what it looks like, 380 pages. Um, a chart which has nine decisions which we believe were uh, deeply uh, mistaken decisions that had consequences and that certainly raised considerably the risks of closing down this exploratory well. And next to each of the decisions, we asked the question, did it save time? And seven of the nine did in fact save time. Uh, most of these decisions were made by BP, either on the rig or on shore, but uh, some were made also by the rig operator, Transocean, which is the largest rig operator of any in the world, and some were made by Halliburton, which services and provides cementing, among other things, to uh, virtually all companies that drill oil. The conclusion that Hallibur Halliburton supplied faulty cement, which clearly failed to seal the well, allowing gas to come up in the riser and in the, in the drill pipe, and Transocean, which was supposed to monitor that process, did not catch it on the instrumentation. Um, those two mistakes were truly egregious. And the third one, not to uh, send the hydrocarbons over the side in a diverter, but rather to send them straight up the main stack, increased the likelihood that it would, in fact, uh, come into contact with an ignition source, as it did, and result not just in a spill, but in a blowout, an explosion, and in the deaths of 11 people. Concluding that three companies were involved uh, made a big difference to our judgment. And we said something that is probably one of the most controversial parts of the report. We said that we have here not the blunder of a rogue company, but the serious faulty decisions of three. One happens to be the largest at exploratory drilling in the world, BP, and the largest in terms of representation in the Gulf of Mexico. One happens to be the largest owner of rigs in the world, and one happens to be the largest supplier of uh, services. And in order to believe, as many industry leaders have made clear to me they do, that it is not a systemic problem in the industry, one has to believe also that Halliburton would never have supplied faulty cement to any but BP. That Transocean would have caught the gas rising from uh, 18,000 feet down on any other rig but a BP rig. And that seems implausible, since these companies operate everywhere. Even if it is true or were true, and I have to say we did not document these problems happened uh, elsewhere, although we do know that cementing failed, Halliburton cementing failed Makara uh, well in Australia uh, a year ago. Um, nevertheless, in order to protect the leading companies in the field from the fact of, or the possibility of their getting shut down in the event of the bad performance or misbehavior of a rogue operator, uh, they're gonna have to take in hand a system that will allow them to police their own industry. So the solution is systemic, even if the problem is not, but we believe the problem is. We also characterize the problem as one of a culture of complacency. Halliburton conducted three tests on its cement that failed. We conducted the commission using the Chevron Laboratory nine specific tests using the formula provided by Halliburton and it failed every one. Um, the um, concept of a culture of complacency, which none of the good companies really think they deserve, arises because if you look back, not just at what happened on the rig itself, but the decisions leading up to it, um, we were never able to ascertain whether people in the upper echelons of Halliburton were even aware that they were providing the cement with the problems that it had. They did not appear to take pains to communicate it to BP. It, there was information provided, but uh, it was buried in a large packet of, uh, of emails. Um, the um, communication among the three companies and even within the companies 
was, was uh, highly questionable, uh, highly problematic, indicating severe management problems. And fundamentally what we understood is management problems in the Gulf with these companies. Um, communication between the shore and the rigs, failure to catch, check with the shore about uh, decisions, a uh, decision to go ahead with fewer centralizers than had been agreed to and were thought necessary because the helicopter didn't bring 16, it brought six. Um, and centralizers play a role in making sure that the spaces around the drill pipe do in fact get filled with cement because if they don't, then hydrocarbons will intrude. Failure to read a negative pressure test when the test was done using two sources of information, one what is called the kill line and the other, the drill pipe itself, when one of those two showed that there was no pressure and the other showed a significant uptick in pressure, no matter how much you, you took out of the system, uh, the indication should have been, at a minimum, that there is evidence that the cementing is not holding. And yet, a decision was made to regard that as a test that was positive. And, um, for reasons that, uh, had, that required you to ignore the fact that the message coming back from the drill pipe was not positive. It was an indication that hydrocarbons were getting into, into the drill pipe. All of these decisions, some of these are unexplainable and some of these were made by people who are no longer alive. We were careful not to uh, ascribe motive to these decisions. I think practically speaking, they were making decisions that they thought were efficient. As I said, most of these decisions did save time and it has been noted that time also is money. And um, this was a rig that was uh, tens of millions of dollars into the red in terms of its, its uh, complexity and the delayed schedule that it had now had to, uh, had to live with. So the uh, report's conclusions with respect to complacency essentially looked at those kinds of decisions and looked at two or three other things. Some of you may remember that the response plan for um, what to do with uh, the uh, oil once it was in the water included uh, careful protection for walruses and the requirement to uh, inform a long dead expert and involve him. Uh, and that was a response plan that was adopted virtually by virtually all of the majors in the Gulf. Um, Tony Hayward, the CEO of BP, told me in our first conversation, we have no effective subsea containment technology or capability. And then we also know that uh, the fatality rate is five times greater in the Gulf than it is in the North Sea, which is a more punishing environment, and which makes that even more uh, hard to understand. So, and finally, so many people in the industry have said, no one expected this. We weren't prepared for this which to me is a surrogate for you got a complacency problem. But that's the reason we said it and it's becoming a matter of some controversy now and we are absolutely convinced that it is in fact the case. Um, I'll turn now to, to the government itself. Over many years and many several administrations, MMS, which was founded by Secretary James Watt in the Reagan administration, has uh, received the revenues from gas development, oil development, uh, on the part of the government. And those revenues are very considerable. They were $18 billion just a couple of years ago, I think 2008. They'll be six or $8 billion, I understand, uh, this year. They um, typically are in the 10 to $12 billion range. These monies are the second largest in revenues after the Internal Revenue Service that the federal government receives. And they go into an agency which has responsibility for leasing oil and gas areas, vast areas of the ocean, which area-wide leasing can be, can be uh, hundreds of thousands, millions even, of acres, and um, determining what the environmental requirements should be, doing environmental impact assessment for plans, and um, doing inspection, auditing, and oversight for environment and safety. All of those functions combined and at least three of the MMS directors who testified before our commission were frank to say, revenues drove this program. And a program that large, why wouldn't it, over time? 
So we made a recommendation that the Interior Department be reorganized and that the regulatory functions, environment and safety be walled off politically from any interference, that a director be appointed for a term of years, much like the FBI director, who cannot be removed uh, except for cause, um, and that leasing and other aspects of uh, decision making affecting the revenues be separated entirely and remain with the Interior Department. We spent considerable time thinking about whether to keep, or in our recommendation at least, to maintain the Interior Department's role in this enterprise. And um, I remember one conversation I had with Congressman Waxman, uh, who was then chairman of the Environment Committee, of, or chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee. And, and I told him, the people who know how to regulate, who really know how to regulate it, regulate, it's EPA. And he said, well, uh, in an earlier draft of my proposed legislation, I had EPA and it almost uh, caused a riot on my committee. Don't go there. And so we didn't. I think we uh, came up with a solution that makes sense. And Secretary Salazar is moving in that direction, though he does not have authority himself, obviously, to change the, uh, to, to provide statutorily for that kind of segregation. But I think it's very important to do it. We discovered also, and in a series of interviews conducted by the Coast Guard and the Interior Department, that the inspectors who are charged with overseeing offshore oil and gas development cannot um, begin to match in skills, in knowledge, and expertise the people they are inspecting. We asked, uh, or Interior Department investigators asked, what uh, do you think about the decision with respect to centralizers and not to have as many as we had been planned and recommended. The answer came back, we don't know about centralizers. Uh, what about the negative pressure test and that and how that was conducted? There were no standards for that in the regulations. We have to rely on industry for that. Well, the truth is that industry has experts in all of these areas and can surround an inspector with that expertise and that specialization. And we have not had inspectors with the formation, with the preparation, the training, or frankly, the compensation that is warranted for such important functions. And so we make some very strong recommendations about the need to increase the support financially for uh, this enterprise. People have, have asked us, how realistic is that in an era of deregulation and cost cutting? Well, the one point that my colleague, Senator Graham, makes often is that when we're regulating offshore oil and gas, we're not just regulating in the way that, say, I did at EPA of private sector functions. We're regulating to protect our investment as a landlord. These are resources owned by the sovereign United States. And that must create a larger self-interest and obligation to ensure that it's well done. And we certainly hope to get that message across on Wednesday and very much hope that it's taken seriously uh, by the Congress. Um, the other aspect of the, of the enterprise which was distressing was that um, the department did not really have any history of taking science into account. And uh, both the NOAA director and the, the um, Council on Environmental Equality chairperson testified before us that they had not even been consulted about the decision the administration made to increase the area of the Eastern Gulf and the Atlantic for opening up for leasing, offshore oil and gas leasing, an area that had been closed for 20 years to that enterprise. Um, they didn't get consulted typically in any serious way by the Interior Department with respect to most decisions. And um, this is confirmed by a lot of our investigations. And so we recommend that the language of the law be altered to require specifically that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration make recommendations, that its recommendations be responded to in writing by the Interior Department if they are not accepted, and that only a compelling public interest be uh, significant enough to allow those recommendations to be disregarded, specifically with, re with respect to sensitive areas and ecologically important resources. Uh, finally, we recognize, I think, that no matter what the priority given to the reconstruction of MMS, to its um, invigoration again, which Secretary Salazar and President Obama, I think, very much want to see happen, 
whether the Congress appropriates those funds or not, <clears throat> it will take time for that enterprise, that agency, to become effective at regulation. One reason I think, in fact, that there has been a, an arguable de facto moratorium on offshore oil and gas development in the Gulf is that there is an insufficient confidence in the agency's ability to do effective regulation at this time. Well, industry, in our view, has to do what other high-risk industries have done after their disasters. If you look back in American history, in 1955, only 20% of Americans indicated they were willing to fly. 55% said they wouldn't fly under any circumstances. There were 12 to 15 serious fatal accidents a year in commercial aviation in the United States. Boeing got together with the FAA. They changed instrumentation. They improved pilot training. They uh, improved navigational techniques, made a number of changes in aircraft. And we now have something like two to three accidents a year. And the American public is confident enough to fly. And of course, there are many more flights than there ever were then. The, um, the nuclear Navy, or the Navy itself, used to lose a submarine once every three years in peacetime until the thresher went down in 1963. And Admiral Rickover decided to take that into account in the future to have a new system that looked at every aspect of safety because there was a welding error that had been made that resulted in water getting into the engine room and uh, destroying the thresher. And people in the nuclear Navy are required now to listen to the last two hours of recording of the people who were dying in the thresher in order to sensitize them to safety. We have not lost a subsafe submarine since 1963. The chemical industry after Bhopal established responsible care. And the nuclear industry after Three Mile Island established the Institute for Nuclear Power Operations. In all of these cases, high-risk enterprises have been made significantly safer. And we think that can be done. And there is every interest on the part of government and the industry to do it. But um, in this case, we think industry should go first to establish the safety institute that has a function of auditing, of monitoring, of um, giving a grade, and spreading best practice for the industry. And I learned firsthand on the board of a company that has two nuclear reactors in Texas, how much respect the people being evaluated have for the evaluators in INPO. And that's what really made me sensitive to the fact that uh, an institution like this can, if well-led, if independent, independent including of its trade association, the American Petroleum Institute, which is a bit of an issue now, if that can be mounted and uh, not have as its objective compliance even, leave that to the regulator, and this, by the way, is very much a supplement to regulation. It's not a substitute for it. But to keep up with a dynamically evolving agency or industry like oil and gas, as it has moved from shallow water into deep sea, it obviously didn't make the adjustment it should have to the fact that the pressures are 30,000 pounds per square inch in the deep water uh, formation in which they were drilling. Um, and, um, much less, for example, in, in 140 feet of water, there's something like at the most uh, eight or, eight or 9,000, so, which creates a whole new set of risks in a very hostile, deep, cold environment that can only be reached by robots. Well, the Safety Institute is something we very much hope the industry will, will take into account and will establish in its own interest. And we'll learn from the example of the Nuclear Power Operations Group uh, and pay people a concomitant uh, salary, and possibly seconding them from other oil and gas companies, or recently retired people in the oil and gas industry. Industry retires early. They retire at 60, so there are a lot of people around that ought to be, ought to be eligible and, and interested. Finally, I'll just say in conclusion, this is fundamentally a hopeful report. We believe that oil and gas can be developed in the deep water. That is where the hydrocarbons are. If you look at the resources available to the United States, they're in Deepwater Gulf and uh, the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas in Alaska. And uh, the country will want to develop those resources, but will have to have a much more assured system of safety and protection for the environment than we have heretofore seen. 
Uh, we trust that this is a wake-up call that everyone will appreciate. If they do not, our um, information would suggest that we've not seen the last of this kind of accident. But as I say, um, we believe that um, the future can be bright for this industry. Heaven knows we need the resource. It's um, a third of our production, and it's going higher, uh, domestic production coming from uh, offshore Gulf. And um, we will work over the months uh, ahead to make more noise about our recommendations and hope that they are heard. We have until March 11th, the formal life of the commission, after which we stand down. There's some talk about our ha constituting ourselves to give a grade to uh, the performance and the accommodation of the various recommendations over time. We haven't set any firm idea for doing that, but uh, if we do, you may be assured that I will repair to the Nicholas Institute to figure out how to do it. Thanks very much.